Hi, I'm Dr. Dominic King. Uh, today, you're going to be talking about uh, tendinopathy classification uh, in the setting of plantar fasciopathy and Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, so just a quick review uh, over the past 30 years of tendinopathy management. Many of you watching this are going to be uh, familiar with how this is uh, adapted and changed. Uh, before 1990s, we called pretty much everything tendinitis or fasciitis when talking about the plantar fascia. Had a couple different types of treatments. Therapeutic ultrasound was a, around. Diagnostic ultrasound, at least in the States, wasn't used that much, uh, but therapeutic uh, in the PT world was quite a bit. Boots uh, and inserts were very, very common, especially patients who have acute Achilles tendinopathy be placed in tall cam walking boot with a wedge. Uh, a lot of research that came out during that time. And corticosteroid injections, at least understanding that there was a high degree of Achilles tendons, partial or complete ruptures associated with that. But for plantar fascia, certainly after the boot in the insert or in conjunction with it, corticosteroid injections were commonly and frequently done. In the 1990s, still calling things itis, this, this thought of uh, general inflammation, Alfredson's heavy load eccentrics came into play within the uh, physical therapy world, extracorporeal shockwave uh, therapy or shockwave treatment uh, was starting to be used for Achilles and plantar fascia. Again, the boots, the inserts, the corticosteroid injections still held favor. As we transitioned into the 2000s, there was a slow move away from tendinitis and fasciitis to this more uh, understanding that there's also degenerative features. There's some tears that have been showing up or at least these increased signals on MRIs that denote something other than inflammation. The uh, glycerol uh, trinitrate uh, patches, uh, there was some good research that came out in the 2000s uh, with Achilles uh, tendon in tendinitis and how that can be helpful from a healing or at least uh, long-term uh, treatment for patients having chronic pain there. And then again, the boots, the inserts, the uh, corticosteroid injections, uh, not uncommon to see some patients come into the office, especially with plantar fasciopathy with, you know, maybe seven, eight injections over uh, a course of time. And then in the 2010s, of course, orthobiologics uh, came out. Uh, not a lot of guidance on use, but certainly a lot of interest in how those could be used uh, to help you know, as they, as they claim the healing process for some of these uh, degenerative tendinopathies. Uh, Tenjet, minimally invasive tenotomy, uh, began uh, to be used, and then the boots, the inserts, and the corticosteroid injections. So the, the perspective on this is that you have over 30 years of different developments in treatments, new technologies for the treatment of tendinopathy, but not really any significant development in how we classify that tendinopathy. We still call these things tendinitis and fasciitis, maybe out of just a ICD-10 diagnosis standpoint or just a bit of comfort and, and comfortability with calling it that. And most patients are familiar with that terminology. We'd like to, uh, today with this classification, uh, kind of challenge some of those thoughts and to, to think a little bit more specifically about the pathology in that tissue. So as a case, uh, we've seen many of these patients who've come into our office, 55-year-old female, atraumatic pain, insidious onset, pain first few steps out of the bed in the morning. You get an x-ray, it shows a small calcaneal and uh, They got pain right at their medial aspect. Uh, the calcaneal squeeze test is negative. You don't think it's calcaneal stress fracture, neurovascularly intact. You know, what would we call this? I mean, most patients come in telling us, you know, I'm pretty sure I have uh, plantar fasciitis. But if we really think about what, what does that mean? We, we're denoting with itis that it's inflammation, but do we really know just with that history that it's inflammation or degeneration or even some partial tearing of the fascia? And more specifically, how, how do we classify that? You know, we, we push on it, it hurts. Maybe we'll get an X-ray, you might get an MRI. But if you look at why this is important, from a research study inclusion criteria, most research studies will take a look and show that they'll include a patient for a treatment if they have greater than three months of heel pain, not responsive to conservative treatment. So they're basing it on chronicity, not necessarily fascia categorization or characterization. Uh, so you could lump in a lot of different micropathologies into one inclusion criteria, and then your outcomes are going to be inconsistent. Again, we see this in Achilles tendonitis, a very similar type of patient that comes in with pain, swelling of the Achilles tendon. You may see Haglund's deformity. They hurt in the watershed area or insertionally. They have a negative Thompson test. You don't think that they tore it. They didn't have you know, some uh, acute events. And we call that Achilles tendonitis. But in the same reason, uh, in the same rationale looking at plantar fascia, 
they just have three months of Achilles pain. Uh, this will come out in orthobiologic research all the time, and you'll see that maybe there's some inconsistencies in how those are being used, but there's not a lot of consistency in what does the pathology actually look like. So our hopes and where we're trying to move is most of the people who are watching this aren't going to really call things heel spurs uh, anymore, right? Uh, they're going to use a term like plantar fasciitis or starting to get a little bit more specific, calling it chronic fasciosis or plantar fasciopathy, using these bigger umbrella terms to be more inclusive. Uh, our hopes are that as research moves forward and in order to provide a more reliable and repeatable and researchable treatment, we may want to classify the actual actual characterization of that tissue. So hopefully at one point we may transition to a type three plantar fasciopathy. And we're gonna go through this. Why we think this is important is because the understanding of how the treatment is applied is much more focused on the tissue we're treating rather than the symptomatology because the symptomatology very oftentimes is very similar between inflammatory or degenerative fasciopathy or tendinopathy, but the tissue may look significantly different. So we focused on musculoskeletal ultrasound. It's, it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy. Uh, you know, the sono anatomy is very dynamic to be able to view from day to day and from person to person. So a lot of this research comes out of uh, our common extensor tendinopathy work. We can see in a normal common extensor tendon, this is lateral epicondyle, radial head, radial capitellar joints, and the common extensor tendon is here. Uh, we can see the uh, arrows here outline the top of the tendon. So this would be a normal looking tendon. We can see uh, areas of hyperemia. So on ultrasound, power Doppler allows you to see neovascularization. So clearly a large amount of inflammation and neovascularization within this tendon. We can see features like degenerative tendinosis. So for those of you comfortable with looking at ultrasounds, you can obviously just see the difference from uh, the fibular pattern of the tendon that we see here, and then the degenerative tendon tissue that's that hypoechogenic, darker uh, area on the ultrasound that denotes that type three, type four mucousy, kind of much more elastic type of tendon tissue, something that uh, doesn't get loaded in the same way of those normal healthy tendon fibers. Then, of course, you can see these uh, mixed fibers. So we came up with uh, the, the thought of, if we can see those uh, ultrasound findings, is there reliability between providers in identifying those findings? Uh, put together a study with six different readers, two were musculoskeletal radiologists, two fellowship trained uh, sports med docs, and two novice uh, sports medicine fellows, uh, read 50 different common extensor tendon uh, videos, and then graded them on a scale of either negative, which meant none or minimal, or positive, meaning more than minimal. And we looked at several different features, uh, and long story short, uh, we were able to show that that hypoechogenicity, that focus of degenerative tissue, and hyperemia, the neovascularization on uh, power Doppler was highly reliable. It was accurate. The other features really didn't show up as uh, reliably from an inter or intra-rater reliability standpoint. Uh, this was the first study uh, that evaluated all these findings together, and this is what we use to underscore what we call our intratendinous or intrafascial content model. The reason for this is going back to the original slides, the variability in patient symptoms and likely the variability of outcomes to the different treatments that we apply to those tendons or fascia is likely related to the variability of what the content is in that tendon. So if we look at those uh, shots again, of uh, the different features of this tendon, and we looked at a cross-sectional slice of each one of them, we should see something different, right? So the first tendon, you have this nice, densely packed, dense, regular connective tissue, type one collagen, nice, bright, tightly packed. Uh, a tendon that was mostly inflammatory would have plenty of those good fibers as well, but you would have this neovascularization mixed in that's going to cause swelling, it's going to cause pain, it's going to stretch against the sheath, so patients are going to feel that tightness and inflammatory pain. The degenerative tendon still can cause swelling, but because it's devoid of inflammation, they don't have that more acute, swollen, hot, angry type of feeling, but this is going to be different type of tissue that feels stiff. When you don't use it as much, it tightens up. The more you work it, the more it loosens up, it feels different. So those are kind of different uh, symptomatologies, different presentations. And then of course, if you could have either one, you could have them both. So a, a mixed feature. And this is where we developed our classification system off of. So we consider a normal or a type one tendon to be a tendon that is devoid of tendinosis or hyperemia. So it's essentially what we would call normal. A type two would be an inflammatory tendon, something that we would consider to be tendinitis not really much tendinosis, 
more hyperemia. And this is a very qualitative grading scale, but it's what is the overall characterization of this tendon. This is an inflammatory tendon. A type three is a degenerative tendon. It's not that big, hot, red, tender, swollen tendon. And then a type four would be that inflammatory and degenerative. It has features of both. It fluxes, it waxes, and wanes uh, with those features depending on use and depending uh, on uh, what the patient is doing and how they're presenting at that time. The important piece of this is this helps us to understand where different applications of treatments may apply. So if we go back to uh, orthobiologic research, and in this case, looking at minimally invasive tenotomy, if we isolated only applying minimally invasive tenotomy to type 3 and type 4 tendons, that type of research is going to give us much more reliable results and repeatable results rather than grabbing everyone who has chronic plantar fascia pain or chronic Achilles tendinopathy that failed a boot in a wedge uh, and didn't do well with therapy. And so it's important as you're moving forward with wanting to bring minimally invasive tenotomy into your practice to have a really strong foundation of sonoanatomy and some way of classifying the tendon. This is one way we feel like it's a very qualitative but very easy way to kind of grasp onto, am I treating an inflammatory tendinopathy or there are some degenerative features? And our feeling is that minimally invasive tenotomy has a specific role in the treatment of those type 3 and type 4 fibers for fasciopathy or for tendinitis. Thank you very much.